you trust him this morning? Do you know that we can? We can trust him this morning. We can depend upon him this morning. this message to you this morning the song says it so we're just reaffirming the very same thing Nehemiah. you said you said it is done it oh is you done. said it Lord you said I believe I believe it you said you said it is Lord, we thank you. 
you this morning that your word is a sure foundation and your son has already accomplished for us what we need. Help us to believe today for all these things in our hearts and in our minds and our situations. But Father, you said it. It is done. You've accomplished the victory for us. Help us to reach out by faith and receive it in every circumstance, in every heart, in every family, in every life. We ask it today in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So good to see everybody. So good to have you with us this morning. And uh, so glad to be here once again. I was talking to Pastor. Uh, am I getting a feedback from me? That's probably us. If green light means it was off, it was off. So we're good. We're good. Technical difficulties never hurt us. Amen. Amen. Well, let me take a look at you, because once I get started, I won't see you. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate having the invite. I was talking to Pastor Matt, and I was looking over my materials, and I was so used to uh, having the opportunity to be with you every year, I, I didn't realize that until yesterday that we had missed a year. So I apologize for that. My back was out last year about this time. It was hard for me to even even walk, and then it was just difficult in scheduling it, but it was so good to be able to come back down again, and I'm so proud of what Pastor Hebert and his wife and the team have done. I'm proud of you, because you're in a church that the church is preaching the truth to you, and you're growing, and give the Lord a hand clap for that. And I understand there is a celebration going along today, somebody's birthday, somebody important, Somebody that if she hadn't done what she did, nobody would be here. Is it Sister Abear? Is that is that? Yeah. Would could you give her a happy birthday and a big thank you? If it wasn't for her, you wouldn't have a pastor. Yeah. So celebration later today, and thank goodness for that. And. We appreciate all that you're doing. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, with me to the book of Habakkuk. If that shocks you or gets you disturbed, uh, go to Matthew and go five books to the left. You'll find it. <laughs> we're not going to stay there, but we're going to start there. Habakkuk chapter 2. And uh, as I introduce my text to you today and my subject to you today, you'll see why that song was so apropos. Uh, Lord, I believe it. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. If you found it, say amen. If you're still looking, that's okay. We'll, you'll catch up with us. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2. A prophet Habakkuk prophesying during the day, same time as Jeremiah, a time where Israel was fast removing itself from relationship with the Lord. And the Lord had told Habakkuk a few things. And you know what? He didn't really comprehend or understand what God was doing. How many of us get a little confused from time to time about what God just might be up to? Well, if, you, if you're never confused, let's get you saved and uh, get you started because what God is able to do in a life is amazing. But every now and then, he'll throw us a curve that we didn't expect. And that's what happened to Habakkuk. Because first of all, in Habakkuk chapter 1, he complains, Lord, you see Israel, and you see that they're not living right. It's kind of like a preacher saying, you see the church today, and it's not living right. we got to do something about it. And so God speaks to the prophet, and he says, I am. I'm sending Babylon down here to wipe out Israel. And the prophet takes a look back, and he says, oh, wait a minute. Wait, well, wait a minute. How can an evil nation correct a, a, a righteous one? Well, Habakkuk, you were just complaining about the fact that the nation 
wasn't doing very well as far as righteousness, and I've, I've got this plan. And just because it didn't match up with the prophet's plan doesn't mean it's God's plan. Sometimes what doesn't match up with our plans is God's plan. Thing is, we just can't see what he's got right around the corner. Right around the cement wall that we can't see through, that we can't get over. And that brings us to the text. Chapter 2 and verse 2. In the midst of this conversation with Habakkuk, he says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables. Tell the people what I said. Destruction is coming. The power of Babylon will overthrow Israel and seriously damage the walls and the city and the temple. And the people will be taken captive. Sin always takes you captive. You can't win. Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. In other words, this word needs to be spread. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. Along with the message of destruction that God had spoken regarding Israel, he also gave Habakkuk the promise, I am going to restore after this correction. I'm going to build back up again after I have corrected my people. I'm going to strengthen my people and establish my people. The Bible tells us not to fear and not to reject the chastening of the Lord because when he chastens us, it's because he's fixing us. He's adapting us to make us better even though it's not pleasant. So the whole word to Habakkuk was there's going to be a downfall, there's going to be a uh, powerful fall, and yet I'm going to bring back up my people. Let me tell you something. There's nothing and there's no sin or there's no event in our lives that our God, the God that we serve, the God that this church proclaims, can't bring you out and through of. Nothing. Hear me. Nothing. Move. The unmovable. Break the unbreakable. Nothing. The impossible that stands before you this morning. Nothing that he can't do. So for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, Though that restoration isn't as quickly as we'd like, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold his soul which is lifted up, the person that is proud, the person that is arrogant, the person that is trusting in their own ability, their own uh, strength, their own talent, their own ability to manipulate through something. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. I want to minister to you this morning that message, and I'm not just going to stay in Habakkuk. There are four passages, so, you know, you're going to have to give me till about 2 o'clock, but... There are four passages in the Word of God where this terminology is used. Four. If God says something once, that's vital. If he says it twice, it's for emphasis. If he says it more than that, it's a sure thing. It's a so solid that he wants us to know it. So when you leave here today, I want you to know that you have the capacity. I want you to know that you, you, you have the capacity to travel through anything and everything that lies before you, but you have to approach it by faith. The just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for bringing me to this location, to these people, Lord, that 
are gathered here today and perhaps those that watch over the internet at some later time. Father, we're asking that you would touch the heart and life of every believer here. Challenge us today to believe you for the impossible, to help us break the unbreakable, to see that which is not feasible to come to pass because we believe that if you have said it, if you have spoken it, if you have declared it, that there is nothing, there is nothing that can stop it from coming to pass. And we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. And amen. amen. The just shall live by faith. For those of us that are Protestants in the Protestant religion, I'll say, in the Protestant organizations, uh, the Protestant organization was formed really from 1517 and beyond. A man by the name of Martin Luther, a Catholic priest, began to look at some of the activities of the church that he was a priest in and was offended when the Catholic church started to sell what, he, what they called then indulgences. Indulgences was the idea, if you pay enough money, we can talk to God and get rid of your sin problem. And it just threw Martin Luther over the top. He said, this needs to be fixed. And he nailed a 95 thesis to the door of Wittenberg Castle in Germany and said some things that needed to be corrected that the word of God corrected for him. And though he, even though he didn't mean to do it, even though it was not his intention to cause a split in the Catholic Church and form a Protestant uh, congregation, that's exactly what it did. And rising from his, how shall I say it, Rise, rising from his resistance of certain doctrines that were not in line with the Bible, came the cry, the just shall live by faith. We're not saved by paying money to the church. We're not saved by doing good works. We're not saved by doing enough good things that our bad outweighs our, our, our good outweighs our bad. We, the just, those, the just shall live by faith. And it became the cry of the reformers, Zwingli and, and Calvin and others that established what we look at today as the Protestant um, congregations around the world. And certainly they have split off, but that cry, the just shall live by faith, was primarily concerned with Martin Luther's view of Romans 1, and we'll look at it today, uh, where the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And he equated it in his mind, the starting point of that revelation, 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 revelation. with God because of what we believe. The truth of it is, is that all of us, no matter who we are, could never qualify based on works, based on what we do, based on how good we are. Because in the mind of God, goodness has to equal perfection. There has to be an, a, a status of perfection for us to have a relationship with God. Well, we're all out if that's the case, but God has made a means and God has made a way by sending his son so that all who believe would be imputed righteousness. You're given, as you believe in Christ, the righteousness of Christ. And that allows God to instantly take up residence within you, instantly make you a new creation. That's why you can't stay the same after you get saved, because you're recreated on the inside. And the Holy Spirit moves into the interior and begins to lead and guide. Up, oh, don't dress like that. Up, oh, don't go there. Up, oh, don't say that. Don't do that. It's not rules and regulations. It's a living God living on the inside of you that begins to direct, that begins to instruct, that begins to lead. So our entrance into this relationship with God has to be by faith. So the reformers were right. 
But when we start to look at the content of the word of God from which this word came, the just shall live by faith from Habakkuk, we find out that the issue really isn't salvation. It's accurate, that's how we get saved, but the just, follow it through, let's break down the words. The just, who are they? They're the ones who are justified. There's only one way for you to be justified, and that's to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and God declares you legally innocent of all charges. That's when you're justified. So you got to be saved to be justified. you got to be saved in order to be declared just. Are you following the thought? And God's people whose faith was in him appropriately and through the sacrificial system that he had raised up through the children of Israel were the just ones. It was amazing. God had one sacrifice one time a year. The high priest would go into the temple and would go into uh, the Holy of Holies and offer up uh, two sacrifices, one for himself and one for Israel. And if that was accepted, then justification would actually be applied to Israel for a full year. A full year, a full year. That's why when they grumbled and complained and, and, and didn't do anything they were supposed to do, God could still say, I don't see any iniquity in Jacob. I don't see any perverseness in Israel. How could he say that? Because he had given them the sacrificial system. They trusted in that sacrificial system, and it was God's legal means to declare them justified. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. But because of the sacrificial system, God could say, I don't see any sin in Israel, and I don't see any iniquity in Jacob. Now, the good news is 2,000 years later, our high priest entered into the Holy of Holies and offered up a sacrifice once for all, never having to be repeated again. And so God looks at those of us that have, have placed our faith in Christ and said, I don't see any iniquity iniquity in Brother Lauren. I don't see any perverseness in Brother Lauren. How can he say that? Because I'm still not what I need to be. I'm still not what I'm going to be. I'm not what I used to be, but I'm in a process of being transformed. So in my imperfection, how can God say, I don't see any iniquity in him. I don't see any iniquity in her. Because we've been justified by faith. Do you understand the status that you have? in order to be called the just ones of God. Do you understand? I mean, it ought to make you shout. It ought to make you happy. It ought to give you happy feet. It ought to make you cry. It ought to make you say, thank you, Jesus. Why? Because we're a bunch of knuckleheads. If it was up to our abilities, we'd all be kicked out. So the phrase, let's work it through, the just, those that are justified by faith, watch, shall what? Shall live. Oh. Shall live. Want to live today? Want to experience abundant life? Want to, want to have God at work in your life consistently? The justified shall live by their faith. Meaning that it's not just faith that saves us, but it's faith that maintains us and it's faith that changes us and it's faith in Christ and what he's done faith in God's redemption plan that allows God to work on our behalf and the first thing that the just are going to experience we find it in Habakkuk we find this thought that if you're going through something difficult there's only one way to travel through it if you're a believer I wish I had some believers in here. There's only one way to address your issue. There's only one way to look at it. And that's through the eyes of faith. Those that are lifted up in themselves, those that think they can handle it, those that think they uh, can traverse through life without any outside help, and God will approve of them and applaud them and say, Woohoo, look at this guy. Your soul's not right. 
Because those that are justified, those that have been saved by faith, are also going to be living by faith. They're trusting in the Word of God. What does God's Word say about you? What has God said to you? Do you know that the Holy Spirit living in you will talk to you? He will lead you. He will guide you. He'll make promises to you. And some of you are sitting here thinking, there's no way that promise is there. Wait a minute. Wait, I came to tell you, the justified ones shall experience the promise of God by faith. Wait for it. The vision may tarry, but wait for it. The promise may tarry, but wait for it. That person you've been waiting on to get saved, God said you would, and you haven't seen it. You don't know how it's going to happen. You have no clue as to how it's going to get done. But the just says, God, yes, I believe it. I believe it. You said it. It's done. God, you said it. I believe it. Now, our belief is doesn't make God work, but it enables his plan. It strengthens ourselves. Our faith will strengthen ourselves as we tarry on the circumstances, tarry in the, in the problem, tarry for the promise to be made. Is anybody in here tarrying for a promise? Anybody waiting on God? Yeah. Well, the justified ones that are saved by faith are also going to obtain the promise of God by faith, not by works, not by confession, not by events. Boy, us Pentecostals, and I am one, we're big on events, you know. We need events, you know. We come on down to the altar and have an event and get up here and get prayed for and have an event and get baptized with the Holy Ghost and have an event. Now, let me say something. I'm not making fun of those events. They're vital. They're important. They're powerful. Some of them will change the direction of your heart and mind in a moment, in an instant. God shows up with you in your house, shows up with you in your car, shows up with you wherever you are. Those encounters with God, those experiences are wonderful. But the just shall live by faith, not by experiences, not by momentary glimpses, not by a secondary flow of the Holy Spirit that Woo, helps us get through for that hour. You got to wake up every morning and say, God said it, and I believe it. God said it. It is done. God said it. I believe it. See, your faith is now not in you, but in him, what he has said. So this morning in your circumstance is your faith in the word of God. If you're here today and you're saved, you've been brought in by the power of God. Is your faith in the word of God? Is it in what he said? That's what you have to determine in your heart and your life. You're going to hold to the just shall live by faith. Amen. Go to me, go with me, go to me. Yeah, go with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, and I've already covered this, but I'll hit it again. Galatians chapter 3, and the status in Galatians, you know, because your pastor has taught you. A group of believers discipled by Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey entered into relationship with God by faith. And a group of men we refer to today as Judaizers came right behind Paul and said, well, it's good that you've accepted Christ as your Savior. You need to do that. But now that you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you need to add circumcision. And you need to add keeping the law of Moses. Otherwise, you're really not going to make it. You're not really the just. And so the whole book of Galatians is dealing not only with the status of justification, but how the believer grows. Again, the just shall live. I want it ringing in your heart by the time you go to lunch. The just shall live by faith. And Paul establishes this in verse 11. He says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith, verse 12 of Galatians 3, listen, 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 and the law is not of faith. Yeah. 
The law was the guidelines for the old covenant people and how they were to run their relationship with God. It's not my covenant. It's not my covenant. It's not my covenant. My covenant is a covenant of faith that establishes me with real, as in relationship with Christ. I'm not accountable to Moses and his law and God's law under Moses. I'm now accountable. Look out now. Here it comes. You are accountable. Did you know you were accountable? You are accountable. Let me say it again. You are accountable. If you didn't know, you are accountable. But you need to know you're accountable to Christ. You've been freed from the law so you could be accountable to Christ. So don't go saying, Brother Larson said, I don't have to live right. I said, no. I said, you're not accountable to the law because that covenant and that process of rules and regulations is not conducive to living by faith. It was set up for people that did not have what you have today. The just shall experience righteousness and transformation by faith. You can't have enough events. You can't do enough works to transform yourself into the person that God wants you to become. And you give flesh in us just a little chance, and we will revert to that so fast it'll make your head spin. And we'll do it sometimes and not even see it. It, it, it just... It's, it's, it's what we're used to. It's the default position of the brain and the heart. We'll go to it just like that and embrace it. When I say you're under Christ's law, not Mosaic law, I say, well, tell me what Christ's law is so I can keep it. Well, we have to learn righteous action and discern them separate from unrighteous action. But there's no way outside of the new covenant that you can keep. Christ's law, unless you understand that within the context of Christ's law is the means by how to live for God. And he said, keep your faith in his word, in me, and what I have done for you. Righteousness is not accomplished by the law. Your sin problem won't be defeated by law. And I know you may not trust in the Mosaic law, but you sure can trust in your disciplines and your Christian practices. Now, just like events and circumstances, we need events and we need disciplines. But you can't put your faith in them. Because law is not of faith, your rules and your routines are important if they open you up to the truths of God, but they don't earn you righteousness. Amen. Amen. And they don't establish righteousness. And they don't produce righteousness. They can produce you being able to speak with God and hear from God, and that's important. So they are important, but you give us half a chance and give us a set of rules, how to live for God, and I'll check off my boxes, one, two, three, four, and five, and then I'll be trusting in what I do and not in what God has done. That's creating a law that I live by. Yeah. So many times we take the wonderful, precious instructions of the Word of God and we make them into a situation of works that we think makes us holy that we have lost sight of the just shall live by faith. Am I boring you? Are, you? are you okay? So, you know, when we find these things in our lives that we're trusting in, we don't throw them away. We just quit trusting in them as the means of righteousness. We don't throw away prayer. We don't throw away Bible reading. We don't throw away church attendance. We don't throw away giving. We don't throw away all the Christian practices that are a part of the Christian process. But I don't place my faith in them and in the doing of them thinking that's what makes me good with God. Because it doesn't. What makes me good with God is my faith. It's my faith. My faith, the just doesn't turn to law and rules and routines because the law is not of faith, but the just 
shall live, come on somebody, by faith, by faith. The just shall live. So are you trusting in what God said he would do according to his word in your circumstances? Are you trusting in your status as a just one that he has provided for you free of charge to you? Are you trusting in what he has already said to accommodate you in the circumstance you now live in? If so, then you're living by faith. If not, you need to hear the just shall live by faith. Are you trying to transform yourself into something that you uh, think you need to be the way you have to be and you think that I'm not doing enough, I've got to do more, I've got to fight? If, if that's your mindset, then you're not living by faith, you're living by law, and the law is not of faith. Again, doesn't mean we throw out Christian disciplines, throw out Christian practices. We throw out faith in disciplines, throw out faith in Christian practices. Because the law is not of faith, and those of us that are justified shall live, experience life, experience the power of God because of my faith. Woo! Amen. All right, number three, let's go to Romans. Didn't know I could preach four books in 45 minutes, did you, Pastor? Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. Sweetie, would you give me that water? It's right there on the seat next to you. Thank you. Oh, and I didn't even introduce my wife. I'm going to get home and beat. Since she stood up, would you stand up? Let them see you. Stand up. This is my wife. Now you see why Joseph is handsome and Grace is cute as a button and Rachel and Joy too. Verse 17 of Romans 1, Paul would write in his introductory motions to the church in Rome, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just, my, 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 shall what? Shall live by faith. One author that I really liked and a commentator made a comment on the, on the uh, words that the righteousness of God is revealed. Here it is, from faith to faith. I love this. He said this, it's faith from start to finish. Now you have to understand that the whole purpose of Romans is to reveal the righteousness of God to humanity. Don't you want to be righteous? Don't you want to walk in righteousness? Don't you want to know how to obtain righteousness? Yeah. Well, it's righteousness can only be revealed to those who operate from faith to faith. Faith from the beginning to the end. The same way that you started your relationship with, with the Lord is the way that you walk and the way you finish it. Faith from start to finish. The just shall live by faith. Now in Romans chapter 3, we hear the doctrine of justification. Really it starts in 321 and runs through 511. And then from 512 through the end of chapter 8, we deal with sanctification. Chapter 9 through uh, 11 is a warning not to disregard what Paul is teaching. And chapters 12 through 16 gives us practical Christian living, what our faith should produce. Faith produces works. Proper faith produces works. Works don't produce faith, and works don't produce righteousness. Proper faith produces proper works. So Paul, in this wonderful epistle, from the beginning to the end, describes to us faith. But in Romans chapter 3, turn with me, if you would, please, to uh, verse 21. Romans 3 and 21. And Paul says here that the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What is he saying? He's saying that the law 
is not of faith, and now righteousness that God wants to reveal has to be revealed and encountered, experienced and maintained by by what? Talk to me. Come on, church. I'm here to listen to you. The just shall live by faith. Yeah, and so Paul is saying this new covenant that we have is a covenant that's established by faith. It starts with faith. It travels through the whole gamut of experience through faith, and it'll end by faith. I'm saved by faith. I'm being saved by faith. And one day when the trump sounds, I shall be saved because of my faith. Now, faith has this somewhat ambiguous notion that it's just something that I believe. But Paul in this chapter qualifies faith for us in a way that he doesn't do anywhere else in the scripture. And it's because he's got the time to travel with me to chapter 3 in verses 24 and 25. Here he is telling us it's faith from start to finish, but the justified ones, and we're in the section of the book that talks about justified, he says, being justified, you see it, 324? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In verses 24 and 25, he's not going to just talk about faith. He's going to talk about what our faith has to be in. Your faith starts with a person. Your, your faith must be, listen, in Jesus. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved. You got to know the name. I said, you got to know the name. I'm going to drop a name on you. Here it comes, Jesus. You got to know the name because there's no redemption outside of him. There's no other savior but him, and he's the savior of all men. You got to know who to place your faith in. I said, you got to know who to place your faith in. It's not in Pastor Matt, even though he's a great guy. Pastor Robert, great guy. Sister Naya and all the rest that I know that are here, great people. Myself, well, maybe not so great. But you can't place your faith in men. You place your faith in the man, Christ Jesus, because he's the son of God. That's who your faith has to be directed towards. So righteousness and justification, the just living by faith, you have to experience freely through grace the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Nobody else can save. Church doesn't save. Actions don't save. Jesus saves. They named him Jesus so that you would know he's the one that would save his people from their sins. His name means Savior. He is what he did. Woo! Yeah! Why am I excited about it? Well, 37 years ago, as a drunk and as a drug addict, not even looking for him, he came into my house and showed up. Yeah. Yes, he did. Break the unbreakable. Move the immovable. Drunk, drug addict. And God says, I don't want you that way anymore. And deep down in my heart, I didn't want to be that way anymore. And after that night when I met Jesus, I wasn't that way anymore. Glory to God. So there's only one name under heaven whereby men, you, your faith can't be in anybody, in any person but Jesus. Amen? Nobody but Jesus. Can't nobody. Do me like Jesus can nobody. Do me like the Lord said it can't nobody. Do me like Jesus. He's my friend. Well, he saved my soul and then he told me to run on. He saved my soul and then he told me to run on well he saved my soul and then he told me to run on he's my friend well, well can't nobody do me like jesus can't nobody 
do me like the Lord. Well, can't nobody do me like Jesus. He's my friend. Yeah, Jesus. So Paul says that this faith that we have has to reside in the person of Jesus. But then watch, look at verse 25. Let's go on. Whom God has set forth to be a what? A propitiation. Woo, that's a big word. Through what? In what? In his blood. Okay, a couple of things here. Where was the blood shed? Where was the blood shed? Where did he shed his blood? So now we got to connect who he was to what he did. And God said that Jesus has been set forth as a propitiation. And you got to get this. That word means covering. And it has a connotation of being a part of the old covenant traditions and, and regulations. And propitiation was what uh, they referred to, and it's tied to the mercy seat. The box uh, called the Ark of the Covenant had a mercy seat or a lid that was made of all gold, and it had two cherubims facing each other. And as I said earlier, the high priest would go in there once a year and put blood on the... On the mercy seat, and the beautiful thing is, in the box, there is a, a, a jar full of manna, God's provision. There is a, a, a rod that budded supernaturally, indicating that there's leadership we need. And there was the law of God that was broken. Now, all of us have messed up in provision, provision and leadership and in breaking the law. Somebody say, ouch. We've all done it. But the high priest once a year would walk in and place blood on the mercy seat. And the Bible tells us that when God saw the tabernacle being built and it was established and all of it was in order, he literally left his throne by the power of the Spirit and come in and dwelt between the cherubim above the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant in the holy place. God dwelt with his people. And once a year, when that blood was applied, God would honor it, as I said earlier in the message, but he would look down towards the box where the law was, where provision was, where the signification of leadership was. And instead of us, instead of seeing the broken law, he saw the blood. He saw the blood. He saw the blood. He saw the blood so that he could stay with the people that didn't always enjoy his provision. Manna again? They didn't always follow his choice of leadership. What do you mean? Aaron and Moses take too much on themselves, and they sure didn't follow the law. Am I talking about a grumbling, bumbling, bunch of uh, just ungrateful folk? I am, just like you and me. But the one thing that I got going for me is not what I do, but it's who I know and who I'm in relationship with. And today the high priest of Israel doesn't go into the Holy of Holies and apply the blood of bulls and goats onto a mercy seat. Instead, Jesus himself has shed his blood... And his blood is applied to the mercy seat, and now he has become my propitiation. He is my covering. He is through the shedding of his blood. So now the justified shall live by faith, but the object of my faith has to be in the person of Christ and in the covering of Christ, the work of Christ, the blood of Christ, the cross of Christ. Now, don't get all upset if I don't say cross every third word or if cross or blood every third word. I want you to know that I do not separate the man of God, man God sent Jesus from the work that he did to redeem me. But we have to emphasize, as Paul did, what our propitiation is and who we place our faith in because if the just is going to live by 
then we need to know what to place our faith in. And right here he tells us that if we keep our faith in Jesus and what he's done for us, we operate as the justified. The just shall live. I'm going to get happy in church today. The just shall live by faith. And faith needs to be in Jesus. And what Jesus did through the shedding of his blood on Calvary. Why? That produced a covenant for me. A new covenant with new promises. A better covenant with better promises. A more, a more secure relationship with him. So this faith that we have, look with me in verse chapter 3 and verse 27 and 28. If faith in Jesus and what... He has done for us, describes the object of our faith. Paul then takes it a step further in Romans 3, 27 and 28 and says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the what? The law of faith. There, don't be confused. <laughs> faith is not a law. But yet it is. It's like gravity. Gravity, when you drop something here on the earth, it's going to fall to the floor. The law of faith says when you place your faith in Christ and what he's done for you on Calvary, you shall live. The just shall live. It's a law. The just shall live. It's a law can't break it. Spiritual truth that God doesn't bend or bust. The truth, the just shall live by faith. And now faith is in Jesus and what he did for me at Calvary. And by trusting in him and what he's done, the power of God's spirit within is released. That spirit that moved into you the moment you said yes to Jesus. You say, well, I'm not feeling anything. Well, I think that perhaps maybe you just need to get a clarification of what to place your faith in. Because I promise you that if you're operating with your faith in Christ and what he's done for you, that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, here's another law, a truth that can't be broken, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of faith produces the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus because the just shall live by faith and faith has to be in Christ and what he did for us. So Habakkuk says the just shall live by faith and says are you trusting in the Lord to finish what he started? Are you trusting him in circumstances? Because the just shall live by faith. Galatians says, don't trust in the law. Don't trust in works. Even though works are right, even though religious activity is something you should involve yourself in, don't trust in the action of doing them. Trust in the Lord who asks you to do them. Because the just shall live by faith. And in Romans, Paul says, it's faith from start to finish. It's the law of faith. What's the law of faith? Always maintaining the view of Jesus and what he did for us at Calvary, which brings us to the powerful truth of Romans 8 and 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, because the just shall live. By faith, circumstances, transformation, continued object of faith. Last of all, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. The author of Hebrews, and it's arguable, some say it's Paul. I had a guy tell me, it's Paul, it's Paul, it's Paul. I said, well, how do you know it's Paul? The Lord told me in my bathroom it was Paul. I like what Origen said, one of the early church fathers. He says, when we get to heaven, we'll know for sure. 
I have the sneaking su suspicion it was Paul, but what's more important is what it's written. Hebrews 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by... The just shall live by... But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. In the book of Hebrews, we run across a group of believers, probably second generation. I think, personally, it's addressed to the Jews in Jerusalem simply because they would have encountered more opposition than anyone. But opposition doesn't necessarily have to be great and grand if we're not maintaining the right object of faith or we're not trying to live by faith. The Hebrews grew weary of Christianity. Paul said that our walk with God is a fight of faith. Which means that there's going to be opposition to your faith. I, I'm amazed at people that say, oh, you guys, you preach, you know, faith and faith and faith, and you just don't want us to do anything. You just make it easy for, and I'm thinking, you've never really tried to live by faith, have you? <laughs> fight the good fight of faith. Paul would write that to his, in his epistle to Timothy, and it really fight the good fight has, comes from the Latin agone, from which we gain our word agony. So let's say it this way. Agonize the good agony of faith. Anybody agonizing today? Yeah. You don't, you're not belittling yourself. You're telling the truth. Paul would say in Romans 8, 17, now that you understand sanctification, and we think, Whew, now that I know the message of the cross, uh, everything is going to be hunky-dory. It's going to be just great. going to be roses and sunshine and candy. Paul says, now that you know the process of sanctification, get ready for the groaning. Because the whole, gro the whole creation is groaning from now until the point in time that the sons of God are manifested. What does he mean by that? after the sons of God are lifted into the sky and transformed into the image of Christ, receiving their glorified bodies, the earth is next. But until then, the creation groans for the manifestation of the sons of God. And we're groaning right along with the rest of creation, trying to fight this fight of faith. It sounds easy in church when we can sing and walk next to each other and encourage one another and hug each other and smile because we all are saying we believe the same thing. But when you get out there and your life is literally threatened and everything about you is under the gun and your friends so-called are starting to reject you and your family is running away from you, and heartache that you can't understand grabs a hold of you. Circumstances you can't define. Uh, you just, it's, you're laying in bed and it's even hard to throw your feet over the side of the bed and say, Jesus. I'm glad in Romans chapter 8 that Paul says, at that point in time, if you'll allow, the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered, and I know Pentecostals tie that to tongues. I don't think that's what it is. I think that it's just this pain on the inside of us that we can't even verbalize, and we say, oh, Jesus. The Bible says in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit takes that and interprets it for us and brings it to the Father, and he knows exactly what to say. And if you think in your life that you will never arrive at this moment in time, you don't know the warfare that you've been in, engaged into by becoming a Christian. Because while we say the just shall live by faith, that means that the adversary isn't flesh and blood, but spirits of darkness 
that will do everything within its power to stop you from believing. You're in a war, no quarter asked, no quarter given. And the Hebrews were in that war. And a lot of them were leaving the faith. It was easier to go back to religion. It was easier to go back to what they knew before they tried to walk this just shall live by faith walk. It was easier because there wasn't, a, uh, there wasn't nobody made fun of me and there was no pain and I didn't have to struggle at night just to keep believing. Faith is not a simple thing. It's not always easy. I love it when the Spirit of God moves in me. I can believe for everything. And other times, I'm trying to just believe to get through the day. It's a fight of faith. Paul said, agonizing the good agony of faith. And this book was written, the whole book was written to tell the Hebrews, don't go back into religion. Don't go back into a form of relationship with God that satisfies everybody around you but doesn't do anything for you. Don't do that. If you're here this morning and life has been tough and you think, you know, I'll just be a good person. I'll go to church on Sunday, maybe. I'll coast. You're doing the same thing the Hebrews did. We're doing. You're starting to back away, and I encourage you this morning, don't back away. Because when you start to back away, God won't desert you. He's not that kind of God. But when you tell God you want to operate on your own, you know what he does? He lets you. Big mistake. I've operated enough on my own these last 35, 37 years, and I've always made a mess of it whenever I said, thank you, God, I'll take it from here. The Hebrews had backed away from fighting the good fight of faith. It seemed too painful, too hard, and too long. And so Paul would come, if he did write it, in Hebrews 10 and 35, and say this, that I say to you this morning, cast not away in verse 35 of chapter 10, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. Don't you just hate that word? Hurry up and wait. Wait, that dirty little four-letter word, wait. Wait. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God. What's the will of God? For you to believe. For you to fight the fight of faith. For you to place your faith in Christ and what he's done for you. After you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Faith from start to finish. Faith for righteousness. Faith for circumstances. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But here's what I believe about you this morning. But we are not of them who draw back. That's what I believe about crossway ministry but we are not they who draw back we're not going to quit going back to being, would you say, a sanctified mess, Pastor? I'm not going back. I'm not going back. So I only really have one gear and one direction. Forward. What's the gear? Probably slow. 
but one foot in front of another, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, a little closer every day, a little more secure every day, a little more trusting every day, because I've come to know that the just shall live by faith. Move the unmovable, break the unbreakable. Lord, I believe, I believe for it. Use your key, Mike. Would you stand with me this morning? God is asking us, and I'm preaching to you, and you can. Really, I'm preaching to me, and you can come along with me if you'd like. But the answer to the problems that you're existing in right now is faith. I know that seems like an oversimplification, but if you're waiting on the vision, the promise, the word, it's by faith. If you're looking for freedom from sin and righteousness, it's by faith. Faith from start to finish. Faith in Christ and what he's done. And the one thing, the one thing you can't do, the one thing you must not do, I beg of you not to do, is give up and walk back to where you came from. Don't give up and go back. Even if all you can do is make a quarter of an inch a year forward, go forward. Break the unbreakable, move the unmovable. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. for something. You need to believe him for something. You can stay right where you are and get exactly what you need. But these altars are open. I talked about experiences. Sometimes it's just that step of faith that says, God, I'm desperate. I need you to move. And maybe that step of faith is just stepping out from right where you are and coming down in front of everybody and just say, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I need a miracle. I need something impossible. I need something of God that only God can provide. And you can have it right where you are. He'll give it to you if your faith is there. But if there's a need there this morning, come and worship with us as we sing it. Come and praise Him for it. For the just shall live. The just shall live. The just shall live by their faith. Hallelujah.